do you want to take the lead and first of all share a little bit about your background although we shared your bio sure. uh, we would like to hear from you um, in terms of you know what has been your experience and also we can start listening a little bit about your your new book that is going to be published in, in May. Right. Okay. I've been writing about international affairs for nearly 40 years. Uh, just years. And I, I've been teaching for nearly 20 years at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, covering crisis and um, international conflict. That, those are the, the two areas that I teach. On the side, for the past 15 years, I've been training journalists in the field, probably hundreds of them all around the country, all around the world, in various aspects of safety. And that really is the center of my work at the moment. And um, my new book, which is coming out through HarperCollins in May, is called How to Drag a Body and Other Safety Tips You Hope to Never Need. And essentially what it, what it is, is a compilation of my lectures at Columbia and elsewhere covering every single type of peril there is. It, it's basically a working manual. Um, it's, it's most useful to journalists, I think, but it's also aimed at the general public. Um, so something like this pandemic and how to prepare for it as it was unfolding um, is one of the types of things that's covered in the book. And um, since we've entered this latest crisis, a lot of people have been asking me for advice and then Thanos asked me would I come and speak to Thank you very much for doing that. So um, that's how I ended up here today. And, you know, basically I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. I think it's probably most useful for you if I don't lecture, but you just share any concerns you have and then we can try to problem solve them. I had shared two documents. One is the Committee to Protect Journalists Guidelines on safely or as safely as possible covering um, COVID-19. And I really think it's the best thing out there. It's, it's quite a long document, but it really goes into the best um, practices for logistics at the moment. Um, and then I had a, 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 there was an interview with me in the New York Times about a week ago, exactly a week ago, about how to cope with lockdown for those people who haven't been through crisis situations before in similar lockdowns. Um, I'm happy to cover any of that material in this conversation or anything further. I'm really here as a resource for the rest of you. So, um, you know, I hand it over to you. Any questions you have, I'm, I'm available. Uh, I, let me say that if any of uh, the participants here uh, wants to, to have a question and wants to ask anything, he or she has to go ahead, raise the hand and just ask this, the question to our speaker today. I would like to start by asking you the first question. Um, how do you think that the, this new reality will transform, first of all, our ordinary lives as human beings, but more particularly the way that journalists and particularly foreign correspondents who are traveling around the world um, will transform this way of their life and their work? Right, well, as we all see now, we're all working at our bedrooms or offices at the moment or our living rooms. I mean, for those people who have not worked at home before, this has become the new reality. And I think the most important thing to keep in mind here, and I'm approaching this the way I would uh, another type of conflict, for instance, a, another type of crisis such as a, a conflict, is I think right now we really have to start the planning in the long term. I don't think this is going away in a month or two. So. I think, you know, whether you're an editorial manager or you're a correspondent or you're a freelancer, start thinking really very, very soberly about what your life is going to look like um, with uh, perhaps an extended lockdown of up to four months and after that limited mobility. And to that effect, you know, I would say do the type of preparation that you would do before any dangerous assignment. Think about the equipment you need. Think about a communications plan with your essential sources. Um, and think about what your workflow is going to look like and c continually try to anticipate what might come ahead. One story that I see coming up in pretty much everywhere in the world, which nobody's really talking about, and it's yeah, really it worries me. Uh, is Hello? Do you want to go to the beach? We, we, we hear. need to go by ourselves to the beach. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, one, one story that I think, or one highly problematic situation is going to come up that I think we all have to think about is people who live in areas where there are natural disasters, we're moving into the spring season now and then summer follows. 
Um, if you live in an area where cyclones are common in August, how are you going to cover it if you're on, on a lockdown? What, what do you need to do now to anticipate that you're covering a double crisis? If, you're, if you live in, you know, I, I live in an area where hurricanes are common. Um, how are you going to cope with a hurricane covering that story and surviving it on top of what you're dealing with at the moment? And this is something that I think authorities haven't even begun to think about themselves. And um, that would be something that I would suggest planning ahead for. Do you think the media organizations for, uh, that, the, that journalists and foreign correspondents work for are well prepared when they send a foreign correspondent or a journalist to an assignment to, to around the world or here in the United States? Do you think the media organizations are well prepared to equip these correspondents and journalists to do their job effectively and safely? I think it really varies. You know, the problem with talking about the media is we're not one monolithic force. I think certain organizations are very expert, very professional, have a team of advisors, and other organizations are not well resourced and may not have a very mature leadership. And I, you know, I think we'd really have to go down organization by organization to um, analyze their degree of preparation. Or, the, but it really comes down to foresight. And I would say covering any conflict or any crisis requires prior thinking. And I think a lot of news organizations got caught out with the pandemic. Um, you know, like a, a lot of Condé Nast organizations, for instance, um, they didn't have any way for people to file at home. They hadn't thought about it. So when there was one coronavirus case um, found in the building, it was a huge scrimmage to suddenly get several magazines working from home. They just weren't prepared. Whereas I think the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, which are more crisis oriented organizations, very well resourced, they've got teams of advisors. I would imagine that they were far better prepared for this type of thing. Um, but even then, you know, the thing about a pandemic is how many people have worked in a pandemic situation and quite a few journalists have gotten sick. And I, I'm not in a position to evaluate whether that's the fault of poor direction, directives, or it's just a, a, a matter of just you're exposed, everybody's exposed, and there's a risk. So I don't know how well people were prepared. I think generally, from my perspective, watching it from afar, most media organizations were totally taken aback by this and, and um, were really in panic mode and were reactive rather than proactive. So that's why I would suggest anybody moving forward now to try to imagine a period of extended crisis and be proactive now and try to do as much planning and um, contingency planning as possible at this moment. Because this situation will, will last longer than what we hope and what we expect. I, I think always be prepared. My, my attitude, and this is basically the premise of my book, and my book goes into great detail. I, I wish I could be here for, and talk to you about every 262 pages, but basically the book maps out every type of crisis there is, whether it be electronic harassment or surveillance, whether it be every type of natural disaster, disease, um, rape, harassment, I mean, it, it just basically riots, war, and basically, you have particulars for particular types of crises. You need certain equipment, you need certain protocols, but the basic philosophy is the same. Plan for the worst case scenario. Go there mentally and figure out what is the worst possible thing that could happen. Maybe for some news organizations is that it would be the current uh, situation extends for, of lockdowns extends for let's say eight months, their budgets are cut, 30% uh, of the staff will say, I'm just giving you an example. Maybe that's the worst case scenario. Then try to mitigate it and plan for it. How would you deal with it? So that would be my advice. Just go there mentally. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? And then start thinking about how you would do planning for that. And when, you know, I'll tell you, you know, when the, now what is now pandemic, when it first began in China, just, my instinct suddenly kicked in. I began to think, okay, it's probably going to spread around the world. How are we going to deal with it in my particular household? And then 
we just started planning from there. So we were pretty well prepared because we started thinking about it back in January, February. The people who started reacting two weeks ago are obviously in a much different situation. Like they hadn't quite thought it through. So again, try to do as much forward planning and imagining as possible. And then that will help you uh, navigate the waters ahead. And hopefully it won't come to the worst case scenario, but at least you'll be prepared for it. Uh, Down Kissy has a question. Down is a board member with the Association of Foreign Correspondents. Down, do you do you hear us? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Don. <laughs> Hi, Professor Matloff. Thank you so much for doing this. I apologize. Um, I'm not on video at the moment. Um, That's fine. Yeah, but I did type something in the sidebar. I'm not sure if you saw it. Oh, I, how, do I, how do I see the sidebar? Oh, the, it's chat. the chat function? Yeah. So essentially, as a born and bred New Yorker, you know, I'm used to being people, and I'm just curious. You know, I read that riveting account in the New York Times late last night about Elmhurst Hospital in Queens. Yeah. I, I live in Queens, but I'm on the other side of the borough in the Forest Hills area. So, you know, I've never been there, but I'm just thinking, I'm trying to remember the, the neighborhood. It's dense. It's tight. It's dense. People live in very compact spaces. They're on top of each other. Frankly yeah. speaking... I have friends that considered living there, but it was just too frenetic for them. Yeah. As a journalist, when you look at what the New York Times put out in the emergency room here, there, you know, they, I even saw a photo of the refrigerator truck outside the hospital um, yeah. that's holding dead bodies. How, do you, how would you advise an intrepid correspondent or journalist in New York to approach that? Granted, it's the I, New York I think, Times. Yeah, you have to wear a PPE, which is protective. Um, yeah. I went to the ER of Columbia Presbyterian last week and I oh, had, wow. had a proper mask, proper, you know, didn't touch anything, kept my distance and whatnot. But I really would not recommend doing that type of reporting unless it's absolutely critical. Unless it's critical. I noticed that, I, I don't know how they stumbled upon it, but it was very well done. And there was yeah. a doctor, an ER doctor that provided them with video. So that helped them with the narrative. But I couldn't imagine even standing outside with people that are in line waiting to be tested in the rain. You right. Know? Well, they, if you notice, the photographs were taken from a distance. Yeah. And Sherry Fink's story, which was a front page story about a hospital in crisis, hmm. that was the text piece. Um, Sherry's a doctor. She's, she's spent her entire um, professional career working in uh, emergency situations in hospitals, I can assure you, she had PPE. Mm. She was perfectly correct, uh, protected, and she knew. She also knew medical protocols. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would not recommend that people uh, do close reporting without protective gear. And every time you put on protective gear, that's one set of protective gear that's not available for a hospital. Exactly, that's what led me to the question because I I'm watching NBC's coverage and Ron Allen, who's also a J School alum. Yeah. You know, it's a wide shot. He's out there in Elmhurst. I, I yeah. noticed today, this morning for the first time, he's got gloves on while he holds his mic, but he yeah. has no mask on while he's reporting. But the, sh the shot, the pan is getting wider. Ron was yeah. closer. Him and Rahima Ellis, they're both beat reporters here in New York. Yeah. They are further away from the scene. And yeah. I've noticed that the shots are just getting wider because obviously NBC is not going to send them into the ER. It should not send them yeah. <laughs> We, are. You know, we faced this, we, we watched this with the Ebola coverage. When I, when I worked in um, Africa in the 90s, we had an Ebola, Ebola breakout, and then there was that huge one in 2014. And again, there were a lot of journalists that didn't do that one properly. They went into morgues. They, um, wow. they were also wearing hazmat uh, equipment, which actually sh you should not be wearing unless it's supervised, because you can actually infect yourself when you take it off. Oh. Um, so basically, but the, the right protocol for covering a bullet was just to keep your distance and to, um, to in those, they use chlorine basically just to, to sterilize their boots and, and whatnot. Um, distance, that's the key. And get other people to shoot video from inside. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank I, you. I, yeah. But it's a good question, you yeah. know. I have a question uh, for you, Judith. Uh, what what was the inspiration for you to write this second book? That it was is my fourth book. The fourth book. I'm sorry, it's fourth. Six. Your fourth book that is going to be released in May. Because the coincidence 
you know, it is very symbolic that we're going through this situation right now. Well, the reason why I decided to write it was that as soon as people found out what I did for a living, they would ask me advice. I had a friend who said, you know, should my niece, my 11 year old niece carry a knife on the, the train? I was like, no. And then somebody else said, I'm going down to Puerto Rico for vacation. Um, you know, I might want to have a baby one day. What do I do about Zika? So I was getting all these queries all the time. And I was talking about it with my agent. She's always trying to get me to write new books. And I said, you know, it's funny, I'm getting all these queries. So she was asking me advice about something, like how to secure her banking. This was after Equifax, and she was saying, like, how do I find out whether I've been hacked or not? And then we kind of looked at each other, and she put her glass down. She said, you should just write this book for ordinary, ordinary people. You know, you've got all this knowledge. You're teaching it to correspondents. Even correspondents need it. Think about the ordinary people. You know, people are worried about school shootings. They're worried about climate change and the you know, these extreme weather conditions we have. They're worried about, they go to a demonstration and somebody gets hit by a car and dies. She said, just put it all in a book for ordinary people. So that's how it happened. And it, because you're also teaching this class at Columbia, this and semester it is one yeah, class. I've been doing, Columbia, I've been teaching this for, I was one of the first people to teach in a university setting. Um, so I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. And in terms of, uh, teaching safety to media workers around the world and in America. I've been doing that for about 15 years. And very few people were doing it 15 years ago, so it was something that became very organic and, and I developed over the years. And I'm constantly expanding it and tweaking it and updating it. What have been uh, the major concerns yeah. of your students that you are, what have been the major concerns or, you know, the the, the thoughts that your students have and that you think that they are most important that you would like to share with us? Like, what is the major concern of the new generation of foreign correspondents, prospective yeah. students uh, at your class? I think one of the biggest problems is our recent graduates oftentimes are freelancers and freelancers don't have any institutional backing. So they're very worried about going home to their home countries you know, going back to Kashmir, where they're from, or going to China, where they're from, or going back to Russia, where they're from. Maybe they're freelancers, and they're worried about how are they going to protect themselves when they don't have the resources of a large institution behind them. I think that's one of the biggest concerns. The biggest concern I'm hearing at the moment with COVID-19 is psychological safety. How can they cope with this situation? I think there's, like the general public, people are so anxious and the lockdown takes such a psychological toll on people. And it, logistically, it's so hard to work that, and, and the way financially, I think financial concerns are a very big one at the moment. Are people gonna have jobs? So that's one thing I'm hearing a lot from my students. And in terms of your book, what do you think it is going to be? Give us the three core messages that this book is giving to the reader because we haven't I haven't read the book yet it hasn't been released but hopefully soon you're going to send it to it's us pre-order pre today uh, <laughs> when are, is it is it going to be available soon or is it, is it available they're trying to rush it they're um the physical copies they can't rush production because of the breakdown in the economy at the moment so the physical ones will be available on May 19 they're trying to rush the electronic version and we're still waiting. Unfortunately, you know, with the economy slow down at the moment, one can't move with the kind of efficiency that one would like to. But if you pre-order now, it, it, you'll be at the top of the list when it comes to deliveries. So if you do want a hard copy, and there'll also be an audio book. Um, the main lesson is, I would say, preparation. And this is the, this is the premise of the book. Imagine what your worst case scenario is. Get, uh, go to the best informed sources possible and come up with a contingency plan as well as a communication plan. And a communication plan is absolutely critical. Again, going back to that example of the Condé Nast magazines that suddenly had to leave their building. Um, if there wasn't a clear chain of command in some of the publications, it wasn't um, clear how people were going to communicate on different levels. Um, and I think you know, just hearing anecdotally, it was a very, very confusing time. And 
thing, things were more stressed than they could have been. And I think this is true for a lot of organizations. Let's say there's suddenly a bomb attack that kills or some of your employees or they've disappeared. How do you, um, how do you know, do you know how to contact their, their family? Who do you, what is your chain of communication? If, does your family know who to contact at the newspaper? These are some of the critical things that should be set up in your own personal life, just taking it away from journalism. Um, do you, let's say you have an elderly parent right now and that elderly parent needs medical care. Do you know how to reach that person's doctor? Do you know um, how to reach their pharmacist for that matter? So, you know, just again, do a, do a risk assessment form. What are the biggest risks that you face? And then come up with a plan, both in terms of communication, but also in terms of logistics and equipment and whatnot. You know, how can you best deal with the situation? What do you need to get through with that situation? Now, what we're all finding now is that many of the things that would have been most useful to us in this crisis, we can't get at the moment, which is hand purifier, wipes, masks, um, those who had the foresight ahead of time to go to the worst case scenario stocked up and had it already. It just so turned out we had a bunch of N95 masks in our basement because our basement looks like a prepper's basement. <laughs> I ended up donating them to a major hospital here, but um, I really do think people should always have a, what they call a bug out bag, just a little bag packed with emergencies. You should always have a really well stocked medical supply kit uh, of varying different degrees of what you would need for emergency um, first aid as well as general medications and prescriptions. Uh, let's say have that ready all the time in your house for two weeks. And I think everybody should just have emergency supplies of batteries and flashlights and cables and backups and a whole list of who their critical um, contacts are be it a lawyer, be it your insurance company, whatever. And it should all be in one place. You should have one point person who knows how to access all your passwords. So let's say you're taken hostage. This is a case of somebody who's taken hostage in Syria. Um, the hostage takers decided that while they held him, they were going to take advantage of his bank account and they emptied it. If he, you know, it, as soon as he was taken hostage, if he had had a point person, that point person could have shut everything down right away. So you really want to centralize all your information. I think all of us should have our wills ready. You just never know. And it will make life easier for the other people around you if your will is already set up. I know this sounds very macabre, but that is one of the major tenets of the book of just be prepared, have everything in place. And then when a crisis does hit, whether it be in your news organization or in your personal life, you're all set. You've got your plan, you know where you should be going. Like, I don't know how many people here know if there's a hurricane, do you know what, where there would be a shelter near your house? Most people in New York don't know that, but it is actually designated. So that's the kind of thing you might want to know. Uh, do you know the emergency text number for FEMA in case there's a natural disaster? Most people don't know, but there does exist one. So those are the kind of things that I would suggest that people um, develop. And I, you know, I think, you know, and this also goes for emotional self-care. If you're going into a stressful situation, have your therapies, you know, set up ahead of time, have your resources set up ahead of time, be aware that you may have certain reactions and try to think ahead of time of how you might deal with them when they happen. So it doesn't become a surprise. I think your biggest enemy in a crisis is surprise. So the more prepared you are, um, as counterintuitive as it might be, you're going to be calmer when it actually happens and you have a plan. So that's, the, that's the main, that's the main um, and, then, and then each chapter goes into very, very specifics of how you would deal with a, a, a different, you know, a hurricane, a volcano, a riot. Like, does everybody know where to stand in riot? Does everybody know how to deal with a stampede? Um, what do you do if there's an active shooter? Do you run, do you stay, do you take shelter? So all that's mapped out in the book. So basically I just thought of every type of awful hazard or peril that you might face. And then I go through it systematically in each chapter. Do you expect from professional journalists and foreign correspondents in general to be more well prepared for these circumstances compared to the ordinary people? 
to be compared yeah, to I, I, think we, I think we are um, depending on where we've worked but I have been quite I, I think it depends on your work situation if you've been covering finance in London you probably weren't too prepared for this but if you had been a foreign correspondent who had gone to Beirut or had gone to you know Central America in the 80s or whatever a certain crisis mentality would kick in and I think it would probably help people's coping skills. Um, I would hope so. But I, you know, I think it really is dependent on where you've worked and what your previous reporting experience has been. Being a foreign correspondent is a very wide generic yeah. term. You know, you could be covering foreign sports. <laughs> so it really depends what your beat is and what countries you've been working in. Uh, do you, would you say that the, the way that the technology has um, applied in our lives during the last two decades, particularly with the explosion of social media and automation. Do you think that this has had a negative impact on our readiness to deal with these extreme crisis situations? I think it's helped, and I also think it's it's hurt. I think it's a double-edged sword. Think about all the wonderful information that you can get on the internet now. Um, think about CPJ with their guidelines on how to cover COVID-19. They can update them on a regular basis. We have access to information through the internet, which keeps us better informed. And we have resources on the internet, which, you know, previous, prior to this, it would have been quite difficult. But then we also have an overload of information. And then you have to analyze what's good and what's not good information. And another major lesson of the book is, you know, the first thing you want to do is go to the most reputable source of information in order to make your, um, do your risk assessment and come up with your contingency planning. So, you know, one of the first things you need to do is figure out who is the best source of information and then try to filter any negative information or unreliable or inaccurate information. Out. You've got to stay very, very focused and not, um, and I think social media can sometimes be good, but I think it can be very, very distracting. There's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of rumors, there's a lot of um, manipulation. So I think in a crisis, social media is probably, can oftentimes be a very negative thing. But it, it really depends. I mean, the answer to every question is, it depends. Dawn is raising her hand again. Uh, Dawn? Hi, Don. I'm looking to see your question. You mentioned, hello? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Okay, well, you mentioned something about having a will in place, having yeah. someone have your passwords. What are your thoughts on, you know, for lack of a better term, code words? Let's say I'm taking hostage in yeah. anywhere, even like in the woods somewhere in Canada or Iran, yeah. and I'm allowed that one phone call. Like, how would I properly telegraph to whoever it is I call what's really going on without giving away too much. Obviously you're gonna be in hysterics, but let's say, you know, I've been picked up in Caracas or Istanbul or somewhere yeah. and you know, I manage, I manage to get someone home. Like who do we call right. first? You know, do you call your family, okay. call the US embassy? Like how do you handle it in that, in that moment when all the adrenaline is rushing? Well, the thing is, again, that's where the planning comes in. So your question relates directly to the thesis of the book, which yeah. is you, you will have established ahead of time who the point person is, and that point person and you will have agreed on that code word. And is there any code particular word, language? You know, it would be something innocuous. It might be like, what are the soccer scores? Or, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, okay. So like, let's say, like, so in terms of language, so let's say I call my mom and I start talking about like- Don't call your mom, okay? <laughs> I'm a mother. <laughs> I know, I know. I don't want to give anyone a stroke. So let, let's say I called one of my attorneys and then, you know, what would I do? Like start talking about my favorite restaurant as a red flag so they know that- no, I'm I mean, you would, well, first of all, if you're being held by hostage, peop hostage takers and they allow you one call, I don't think you need to hide the fact that you're in trouble. They're allowing you the call. Mm. So in that case, I don't think you need a code. I think you can be pretty straightforward. Okay. They've allowed you to call one person special to you. Okay. So, your mother. You so just, and generally if a hostage taker allows you to make a call, you know, we've seen this so many times on those videos, right? They usually make you keep to a script. They rarely give you yeah. freedom. 
So I, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, and, and you're not allowed to have a prolonged conversation about a restaurant, but I mean, if, if you really think a code is necessary, have it be something pre-established that sounds, I mean, I'm just trying to think where that would come up because if they're going to allow you the call, they know you're in trouble and they know you want to contact somebody. So yeah. we, well, I'm just trying to imagine what form this would take. Yeah, no, like, it's, come up with something it's, innocuous. It's in the situation, right? Some are more militant than others. Um, some may not allow you that call right away. They'll let, you know, they won't automatically broadcast that they're holding you. But right. um, another thing I, I'm wondering is what about like, you mentioned the bank account logins and the will. What about the social media logins? Like what about- That too, that yeah, too. Want like this the LinkedIn, person, the Twitter. One point person who you thoroughly, thoroughly trust because you really yeah. are trusting your life with it. Yeah. Like for me, it'd be my husband, mm -hmm. who is not my mother. Well, she's not alive anyway, but it, he's, he's a very calm person. He's a colleague and he's been in crisis situations and he's my husband. So he's just, like behind that door behind me is information that only my husband knows. You know, he's, he's the gatekeeper to all my stuff and likewise myself to mm -hmm. him. And yeah. we both know where everything is. So if that requires um, a power of attorney in some respects, right? Because I've had friends who've had relatives pass away and at least in New York state probate, it can be a nightmare if you're not ready. You know, like I know one of my good friends getting into a relative's bank account took close to a year, like Citibank, even a death certificate just was not enough. Right. Well, this is why you have to plan ahead. This is, this is the whole point of the book. Think about this now as opposed to when your really dear friend is taken hostage and suddenly you realize you can't break down there, you know, you can't mm -hmm. break down. That's why we want to do as much forward planning as possible. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, your point. Yeah, and, you know my, my whole thing is that, you know, it's funny, I've been talking to people a lot about wills lately and they're like, oh my God, I don't want to go there. And then I say, but what happens, you know, this disease happens pretty quickly. Do you want to leave your, the people close to you running around trying to do probate and everything like just make it easy um yeah. and and it, once you go there it's just a transaction but i that's my whole point that you should think of things be proactive don't be reactive and yeah. i take your point there may be a limit to how much you can actually organize but at least start thinking about it about who would be that person how would this actually work in, in yeah. reality? This is so timely because once a year, usually around this time of year, around tax time, when I'm doing the paperwork with the accountants, <laughs> they ask me, like they always ask me, well, who's in trust? Like if something happens to you, right. who does this policy go to? Who does your IRA fall to? Who does this go to? So this is another thing to include in that, I guess. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah totally. It's, and as somebody who has dealt with loved ones' wills or lack thereof, you're doing them a favor mm. because they've lost you, you're in mourning, and then you're looking at a mountain of administrative. Oh my goodness. This is why I asked because a close friend of mine, and what, made, what complicated Eileen's situation, frankly, was because she grew up in Chicago in the suburbs, went to school at Penn lived in New York for about 12 years and now lives in Palo Alto as an ER nurse at Stanford. And, you know, dealing with a relative that <laughs> migrated to this country in their fifties and passed away at nearly, I think 98 or 99, she had like different residencies. That, like there was so much she had to prove. And it just, it was just such a nightmare for her. And I remember it wasn't, there was like, there was millions of dollars sitting there. She just wanted it closed and, you know, for closure, for personal reasons. And it's just, they ran her between four different states. And I remember how stressful it was. You know, well, there, doing, you go. Doing, there you go. That's, that's my case for us. <laughs> yeah, doing probate in New York and then dealing with California and then dealing with Illinois. It was a disaster. There you go. My case for us. And she's not even a journalist. She's like a, a nurse. A, you know. Yeah, but then, you know, let's, let's backtrack and look at this from the journalistic point of view. Um, again, most news organizations, and you know, I, I mentioned one, and maybe it's a little bit unfair, but it's just one that I had heard about. Um, but this has happened to so many news organizations. I mean, who expected a pandemic? Pandemic, right? But at the time that it was happening in Wuhan, and then it was traveling to other countries, that's when that was the time to start planning from 
a, an institutional level of the news organization, but also on your own level. You know, did you all have a VPN whereby, you know, you could work off site or, you know, whatever it took. And it's, it's complicated to suddenly move an entire organizational uh, network off site and all power to everybody that's done it. But if, if there had been some foresight ahead of time, it would have been a lot easier for organizations. So again, try to think ahead. What are the next challenges that may happen in the months to come? Are you gonna get more people who are sick? You know, if you're a manager, um, is everybody on staff well-trained and understands how they should be um, dealing with the situation? Is everybody get, have access to um, health insurance in case they get sick? How about psychological care? This is a huge problem I see right now. People are really under stress and there's going to be burnout. Mm. Um, just before we, were, we began this, we were just conversing about how hard it is working at home, um, even with people you absolutely adore. And you're going to have to start thinking about this in the long term, either accepting this is the, the new reality or trying to come up with some way to make the new reality better. Yeah, but, that's, um, that's, a, that's a big issue, especially for people like us that are used to communicating, being in the field, being on the move. Right. And the work we do involves, you know, talking to so many people. And I'm, he I'm getting messages from friends. You know, one of my girlfriends is literally working from her basement with the door locked because she just needs that solace to get through a story. Another one is in his attic at his parents' house in Connecticut, trying not to go crazy. You know, it's like, because you have to meet your deadlines. You have to power through, but can you- No, know, it's, it, the stress is, is, stress is horrific. Yeah. Um, I mean, working from and home. That's what I mean about. Week, but that's yeah, what I mean. Like, one week is okay, but like, can we do this for six months? I don't know. But that's my whole point. That it's something you have to think about and start. Start planning. Start going to the worst place, which is doing this for six months. Now, are we going to do it for six months? And I hope not. <laughs> I, in my, I'm, I'm planning through June, July. That's my plan at the moment. Yeah. I've got a kid in college. I'm already thinking ahead of like, this is really tough on him. Like mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. what, what is his education going to look like? Is there, you know, should we be taking a break? I mean, I don't feel I'm getting my money for this. Is remote you know, it's funny. Bloomberg actually had a piece today about university admissions and how they're oh, struggling no yeah, universities don't know even who to accept at this point because they don't know who's going to be able to even get a visa to fly into the country, more or less get a place to live. Right. And I don't envy their contingency planning, but I think, you know, we're only in control of ourselves. Yeah. That's all we can control. And so I think having a plan and being laser focused about pragmatic um, things actions and preparation and whatnot helps one deal with the unknown. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can anticipate and think about what it would look like if you were doing this for another five months and try to think about what kind of adjustments could be made, um, try to think about just going with the flow, which I know is really, really difficult, but just any, you know, and maybe you don't want to do this five months from now. So then what would your plan B be? Think about that. And maybe there can't be a plan B. So then you go back to plan one. But I, I, I think the only way we're really going to get through this is A, to accept this is the reality and B, try to find a way to make it as, um, as controlled as possible. Because really the only thing we can control are A, our emotions and B, our, uh, our actual physical environment. Mm -hmm. And I think routines are critical. This was in my New York Times piece, I, the interview. I think routines are absolutely critical. This is an abnormal situation, so just try to make it as, a, as normal as possible. And I, I realize how hard this is. Like, I'm struggling with this too. But For everyone, I, think, I mean, yeah, every situation I think, is um, unique, I right? Think, but we're all, I think we're all on the same wavelength in a sense where even if you have a routine at home, it's like, you know, something. I have a friend that's on air here in New York. Her IFB dropped out while she was live on TV on Tuesday because her computer battery, something went wrong and they had to send an engineer to her apartment. This is a woman that's been on TV for 15 years, I think, 16 years, and she's losing her mind. 
Right. So her contingency planning would be to have a spare battery in the house from now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, no, no. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, tend to, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. The battery goes out. Yeah. I'm, I'm, again, this is the type of thing we all need to be thinking about. Again, I can't stress it enough. What is the worst thing that could happen? And then try to plan for it so that when it actually happens, A, you thought, oh, well, I knew this was going to happen. And B, I've got a plan for it. Thank you so much. I'm going to pre-order your book for sure. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully, my worst case scenario, which is it won't be delivered. Hopefully, that will not happen. Well, I <laughs> see. FedEx FedEx you can get you can get an electronic version. So. Yeah, I see. I do see the FedEx trucks in my neighborhood at least, and the, you know, it's funny because they are literally on the front lines. But at the same time, you. <laughs> They, they interact with people in a very unique way. They don't come in for a cup of tea. They drop off a box, right? But, but still, I know my FedEx man. We always chat and, you know. Me too. I I'm like, FedEx FedEx this guy. Guy. like, I've known him for years and he's yeah. got a key to our building. He walks around, but, you know, I, I do see them. They've got gloves on. Yeah. But then you hear, oh, this virus lives on cardboard. It lives on boxes. It does. It's, it's, uh, like, it's 24 hours on, on cardboard. Oh, my goodness. You just wipe it down. Just wipe it down. <laughs> Uh, Judith, do you think that there is some psychological factor that prevents people from planning ahead in these circumstances that they don't want to think that this worst case scenario will happen and they just deal with that only when it actually happens? Well, I was just talking to, um, I have a piece coming out very soon and I interviewed some psychiatrists and psychologists who specialize in crises. And they were saying that actually as a survival mechanism, our minds immediately go to the worst case scenario. It, it's what we, we, our minds, that's what we do right away. And then we may recalibrate and people go into denial, but it's the first thing that people think about because think about it, let's say you're walking in the jungle and you hear a growl, the first thing you're going to think of is the worst case scenario. There's a tiger that's about to attack me. So the mind is wired to be alert to any danger. What you do with that afterwards, um, some people go into denial and other people confront it. And my advice would be, it, it's actually, it seems counterintuitive, but if you actually confront it, you're going to deal with it better because you'll go to the worst case scenario and you'll either come up with a plan or you know, another thing you could do is then go to the best case scenario and then evaluate which one is really likely to happen. Like for me, the worst case scenario is I'm gonna be living like this for another year. My best case scenario is give it July. What's more likely? Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's probably July with, with some limitations. So then I'm planning towards July. So that, you know, and also you can retrain your mind. You don't have to think the way you've always thought. Um, so in answer to your question, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know what the grand majority of Americans or people in Greece are thinking, but I do know that journalists are very, very adaptable people. We're used to improvising. We're used to being um, very, very quick and nimble and flexible. So I think of all the population, and I can't speak for the greater population, I think journalists can adapt to this in a way that maybe other people might have more difficulty. Have Look, you ever... This is always changing. We're constantly dealing with uncertainties. We never know what the news is. We never know what's going to happen any minute. So I think we're really very, very well trained to deal with a crisis like this. Because our whole lives and our whole profession is hinging on the unknowns. I would like if you, if you also want to, to share one, two of your most exceptional experiences that you were under a crisis. I've seen that you shared some of these experiences like at the New York Times article and probably at your book, like throughout your reporting as a foreign correspondent under very difficult circumstances. But can you recall like one or two exceptional crises that you went through and you applied one of these rules that you demonstrate in your book? Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the most extreme situation. <laughs> it was because of this that I began to think about safety training. So the, the case that I alluded to in the New York Times article, I was in Angola and 
it was supposed to be a very happy election that was going to uh, establish democracy in the country after 35 years of war. And nobody had done the assessment. The, the, nobody had done the risk assessment that maybe the elections would go south and that the rebel leader who, um, the rebel leader, Mr. Jonas Savimbi, would not accept his defeat and would go back to war. Nobody had done that risk assessment. So that was a problem. That's what happened. Fighting broke out. My country did not have diplomatic relations with Angola. So I did not have an embassy that could help me. Um, the communications were very, very, um, they were very, very rudimentary. You couldn't really use landlines very well. So I had a satellite telephone that at one point uh, was damaged because of an electricity surge. So I no longer had access to 24 seven communications with the outside world. Um, I had no training in combat or hostile environment training, which is pretty standard now for journalists that cover war. So I didn't know what you did when there was fighting. I didn't know what you did when there were landmines. Uh, then I got a death threat and I didn't know how to evaluate it because I'd never been in a situation like this. So you can see, just as I'm recounting this, there was absolutely no preparation for the worst case scenario. I got out of it fine, I survived, nobody killed me. But you know, it got me thinking, this is back in 1992, it got me thinking, why don't we have protocols in the industry? Oh, I also didn't have a flak jacket. You know, now, now you, these things are standard in a war zone situation. We're talking about conventional war. Um, and that really got me thinking then about, hey, we need equipment, we need protocols, we need planning. Uh, the communications, if anything had happened to me, nobody at my workplace would have known how to reach my mother. It never even occurred to me. My mother wouldn't even know how to reach them. I mean, that was the level of, I know it, it's probably mind boggling at the moment, but it, it, was, it was back in the 90s. We didn't have safety protocols. We didn't have training. And I think hopefully, preferably, and I'm sure, undoubtedly the industry has moved on since then. But that is probably the most problematic situation I was in. And it, it just supports, again, the thesis of the book that you have to have a plan. You have to know how, you have to have an exit route. You have to know how you're gonna get out of this. And if not, how you're gonna deal with it. And I just did not have any of that set up beforehand. So I think that's a good celebratory case. Uh, we have, uh, Thomas, do you hear? Yes, I'm here. Thomas I Barat is from Hungary, is a foreign correspondent from Hungary based in here in New York. Thomas, go ahead. Okay, uh, I would like to ask your opinion. How do you think an editor can avoid the fake news? I think the editor's responsibility to check the news. Unfortunately, the misinformation is spreading, especially in social media. I have my own opinion on this, but I would like to know your opinion. My opinion about disinformation? The misinformation, yes. Uh, there's a lot of it. <laughs> yes, plenty. Mainly in the social media. Yes, I think you have to be really, if you're an editor, and I, and I are you talking about a particular Hungarian editor or are you talking generally? No, I'm, I'm asking generally. Uh, you know, I think we, the journalists, have a great responsibility to tell our readers what the problem is great, but not to be, not to make a panic. And not, I think not to to make them panic. Yeah, and I think as a journalist, I cannot say when the epidemic is expected to end. I can only follow the experts' opinion. Am I right? Right, I think point, point your readers toward the CDC and the, H, uh, the WHO are considered the most authoritative sources at the moment. Here in New York State, I, I think the governor is doing a remarkable job in terms of giving very um, sober yet reliable information. So I think those are the sources that I, I would want people to go to at the moment and that an editor should go to who's in New York right now. But, you know, to report on rumors that they see on social media, I don't think does any, any favors for anybody. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, no answer. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think particularly at a time of crisis like this, whereas you point out the public is panicking, you really, really, really need to make sure that your main sources of information are authoritative, accurate. You know, I think it's my opinion. Uh, the situation is requires the rules of the crisis communication, and the crisis communication rules is very strict. Meaning, uh, we, the journalists, we could say only what the experts uh, say to us, and we, we communicate only the true and not the opinion. Am I right? I think definitely turn to expert opinion without a doubt. Yeah. I, does everybody agree? I, I think we do, right? Yeah. Sorry. We all agree. Good. Okay. Thank Good point you raise. Yeah. Good point. The card. Yeah. The card. We have a card. We have a journalist from Kurdistan who is okay. based here in New York as a foreign correspondent, but he doesn't listen, probably. Uh, he will raise his hand again. I. I no, of course I. Ah, I ah, okay, great. Please go ahead. Hello, guys. I'm very, very happy to uh, be with you and honoring. And thank you. I get a lot of information. And thank you very much. And But I don't have a question. I continue to listen, please. Welcome. Um, do you, what is your major fear and what is your major hope about the current state of media? in the short and in the long term, Judy? Well, one thing which really worries me right now is that with the economic pressure that's been exerted by this crisis, journalists are gonna lose their jobs, particularly local journalists. And then we'll get even less good reporting on the crisis. It becomes a circular, vicious circle. And this is one thing I really, really worry about greatly. And just on a more meta level before this crisis came up, Again, the, the, um, the economic difficulties and the political pressures and the harassment that the media face are obviously threats to democracies. And that's something that I really, really worry about. But, you know, I don't know what kind of shape small media is going to be in and how they're going to emerge from this crisis if there's even more economic pressure to bear on them. And this is something I really worry about are really useful um, outlets of information, are they going to have to close? Are more people going to be laid off? Already they're layoffs. And that's something I really, really worry about. But just generally, you know, I think there is an incredible rise of, and, and this is linked to your question about social media, you know, there's, there's been a massive rise of harassment of journalists, particularly in the electronic digital realm. And this is something that really, really concerns me, obviously. It's, it's a whole other level of harassment and danger that we face. And, is there any and with the rise of authoritarian governments as well, you know, as we know, it makes it harder for journalists to do their job and it creates physical dangers for them. And is there any hopeful and, you know, optimistic approach that we get something better out of this crisis that we are going through right now? Well, we'll all be as immunized. A, as, a, as, an, as an industry and in, in a broader spectrum, as, you know, as a society, do, we, do you think that we learn something as a lesson through what we're going through? Uh, what we learn is that we weren't prepared, <laughs> which unfortunately is what we the crisis to learn, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I hate to bring it back to that, but I, I think the big lesson that we're learning from that is we no society, well, certain societies were better prepared for this than others, but here in America, we were not prepared. And I don't think most European countries were either. Um, um, before we conclude our conversation, would you like to share like something like as a thought that you would like to say as a conclusion before we thank you for your time and for being with us here and we will make this discussion available also on our social media and our website and our YouTube and we look forward also to being in the book presentation. Hopefully it will happen in person in May if things will be better than 
be now right now but we will order your book certainly and we will share our thoughts and you know any comments that we have yeah well be safe everybody don't take silly risks <laughs> um and just try to think ahead and plan in a very sober way i think don't don't react in panics try not to react um in the moment i think take a time to reflect what the months ahead might bring and think about how you might want to deal with it and the best ways for you to navigate it that would be my final advice and again i hope everybody is safe and healthy and gets through this all in with a job and with their health and their families and everything intact thank you thank you very much um may may can you repeat where we can find your book like uh on on book on apple bookstores on yeah it's you can go to um barnesandnoble.com you can go to amazon.com you can go to my website judithmatloff.com you can go to indiebound i n d i e b o u n d.com so you can order it in any of those um at any of those um places <laughs>